A lot of the people come here with a lot of questions. A lot of people come here with some concerns. to describe Hanford would be change. Massive. Enormous. Employment. I suppose it's cleanup. Uh, controversial. Toxic. Taxes. Technology. Bureaucracy. Nuclear weapons production. I, th I think of testing. Energy. Science. Jobs. Unsustainable. Money pit. Historic. Chaotic. Radioactivity. Impossible. It's unbelievable. Unsafe. Complicated. Maybe the best word is Complex. Welcome to Hanford. It's here, in this seemingly nondescript desert of southeastern Washington state, that you will find one of our nation's most compelling stories. Hanford offers everything a storyteller would want, from intrigue and patriotism to controversy and science faction. Hanford, a place that is rich in culture and history, the transition into a community committed to cleaning up a 60-year legacy of plutonium production and waste, and is equally dedicated to delivering on a promise of clean energy and environment for future generations. The Hanford most people are familiar with was born out of an intense race to produce the world's first atomic bomb during the Second World War. Before there was a Hanford, these windblown planes served Native American tribes such as the Wanapum, Yakima, Umatilla, and Nez Perce, who hunted, fished, and gathered traditional foods and medicines along the banks of the Columbia River. With the gold rush and westward expansion, early settlers began arriving to the area in the mid-1800s, establishing the farming communities of White Bluffs and the Hanford Township. Life was hard in those days, but the communities flourished, growing to a population of some 1,300 residents. Everything was hunky-dory. That is, until 1943. The U.S. War Department handpicked Hanford for its plutonium production needs as part of the Manhattan Project. The recently constructed Grand Coulee Dam offered the electricity and infrastructure necessary to operate the reactors. The area was remote and sparsely populated, and the Columbia River offered a plentiful source of cold water also necessary for the operation of the nuclear reactors and the plutonium they yielded. With that, the government gave the residents of White Bluffs and the Hanford Township 30 days to leave, so construction on the Hanford site could begin. The Hanford construction effort began in earnest in 1943, drawing tens of thousands of workers from across the U.S. Hundreds of facilities and buildings, along with their supporting infrastructure, were constructed across the 586 square mile site, an area that would easily fit the city of Los Angeles today with plenty of room to spare. In fact, Hanford is a city in its own right with more than 500 miles of road, 1.2 million square feet of facility space, 12,000 phone lines, and 40 meteorological monitoring stations. At its peak, Hanford employed some 50,000 people ranging from laborers and security personnel to scientists and engineers. One of the world's greatest construction projects of that era, Hanford's B Reactor, is perhaps the site's most iconic image. The world's first full-scale production nuclear reactor. This ambitious engineering feat went from design to startup in just 13 months, under a high degree of secrecy with minimal blueprints, drawings, or designs developed for reference by workers. Well, I was directed to the uh, 
administration building, which is located about where the federal building is now. And I was signed in and I was instructed to uh, go to the 300 area to begin with. I had no idea what I was here for. And uh, I came strictly for several personal reasons and for the money. The race to produce the world's first atomic bomb was running at a fevered pitch. While small amounts of plutonium had been produced at facilities in Chicago, nothing of this magnitude or complexity had ever been attempted. Producing plutonium was complex and messy, with the added potential of being catastrophically lethal. The process started with uranium billets that were fabricated into nuclear fuel rods in the 300 area and transported via rail to the 100 area, where they were inserted into one of multiple process tubes in the 30-foot high reactor core. With water from the Columbia River rushing into the reactor, a nuclear chain reaction transformed uranium into plutonium. It's hard for people to imagine the enormous energy that's produced in the reactor, but as I remember, the, the flow at that time was like 186,000 gallons a minute. And that, that water is entering the front face uh, in, in cold, ice cold, and it's, entering, it's exiting the rear face at nearly boiling temperatures in that short distance of time. And there's 2,004 process tubes that's going through there. So it's hard to imagine the energy that is contained unless you hear and you see it and you feel it. It's just massive amount of energy that you experience. But a startup is a uh, startup like that is, is phenomenal. After a short cooling off period, the now highly irradiated fuel rods were transported to tea plant in Hanford's 200 area. Tea plant was one of several enormous facilities, the size of ocean liners. In fact, they were frequently referred to as Queen Mary's by Hanford workers. It was here they separated plutonium from irradiated fuel rods using a complex and massive liquid chemical bath process. Tea plant was the first facility of its kind in the world. Like the world's most elaborate and intricate gold panning operation, the process yielded minute amounts of plutonium. By weight, the most expensive material on the planet. The extracted plutonium was processed into buttons. Buttons that would serve as the core of the atomic bomb. Millions of gallons of highly radioactive liquid waste, a byproduct of this chemical separation process, were stored in roughly 60 underground tanks, ranging from a half a million to a million gallons in capacity. Ultimately, the Manhattan Project was a success, and the long-kept secret was out. The plutonium produced at Hanford was used in the Fat Man bomb, dropped on Nagasaki on August 9, 1945 forcing Japan's surrender and bringing an end to the war. Ushering in the atomic age, Hanford continued to support America's peace through strength policies throughout the Cold War, producing enough plutonium to maintain a continual and formidable deterrent to any potentially hostile nation, namely the Soviet Union. However, during these critical wartime and national security missions, the thought of what to do with the resulting waste and what its impact on the environment might be was secondary to the need for immediate production and use of the vital plutonium. Nearly 200 million gallons of this waste was held in underground storage tanks, or worse, returned directly to the ground. There were two big headers on each side of the reactor and, and the uh, effluent was then distributed out to a cooling basin for a period of time. And then the water was taken and uh, in an underground pipe and uh, it was uh, went out to the middle of the river, underneath the river, where then it was distributed and discharged uh, there. The sheer magnitude of the impact on the environment is staggering, resulting in nearly incomprehensible numbers. Numbers like 270 billion gallons of contaminated groundwater, 
25 million cubic feet of buried or stored solid waste, 2,300 tons of spent nuclear fuel, 20 tons of plutonium bearing materials, and 53 million gallons of waste in 177 underground storage tanks. This waste is the legacy of more than five decades of plutonium production, making it easy to see how Hanford became the largest, most complex environmental cleanup effort in the world. Uh, materials were developed uh, that have, were highly radioactive, and so they were taken outside the fence and a trench was dug and they were buried. And that was how it was disposed of in those days. The Department of Energy's mission at Hanford changed from production to cleanup in 1989 when a landmark agreement was reached between the Department of Energy, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the State of Washington, known as the Tri-Party Agreement. The accord established hundreds of milestones for bringing the Hanford site into compliance with federal and state environmental regulations. Over the past 20 years, incredible progress has been made resulting in the successful treatment of 4.4 billion gallons of contaminated groundwater, movement of all spent nuclear fuel to dry storage, shipment of all plutonium special nuclear materials designated for off-site storage out of Washington State, and the removal of all pumpable liquids from 149 single-shelled underground storage tanks. Significantly, Hanford cleanup activities have resulted in exposure to the public that are exceedingly low, less than one millirem per year, well below regulatory limits. However, the challenges of cleanup continue to be daunting. It might leave some wondering, what makes cleanup so complicated and why does it take so long? One of the reasons it's complex is because as like when they built the production reactors, there was no blueprint to follow. So we now are in the process of developing that blueprint in terms of the cleanup strategy. We have the combination of both radionuclides as well as chemicals in terms of contaminants that we have to clean up at the Hanford site. So that, that causes us to uh, ensure that we are being very conservative in terms of protection of our workers here on the site, as well as we have to ensure that we're protecting the, in the, the, the natural environments, as well as our culture resources at the Hanford site. And a combination of all these things adds up to additional time, which translates as well into additional cost. Today, the Hanford site geography is aligned specifically to address DOE's 2015 cleanup strategy, as well as the construction of the waste treatment plant that will operate well into the future. Nearly 290 square miles make up the Hanford Reach National Monument and Arid Lands Ecology Reserve. The 220 square mile river corridor area consists of the 100 area reactors and the 300 areas fabrication and research facilities. The central plateau made up of the 200 areas processing and waste disposal facilities, including the inner areas 177 underground tanks. Just like their predecessors 60 years ago, some of industry and government's best and brightest are focused on bringing the latest in environmental research, technologies, and innovations to accelerate the cleanup effort. These 21st century scientists, engineers, laborers, and technologists are busy making a new kind of history. In addition to tearing down, Hanford is also building up. Upon completion of construction of the waste treatment plant, Hanford will be home to the world's largest chemical separations facility. The pre-treatment plant alone has a footprint equivalent to four football fields and will be 12 stories tall with nearly 1 million feet of piping. In 2019, this first of its magnitude facility is scheduled to begin to vitrify or turn into glass liquid tank waste, making the waste much, much safer and easier to store and eventually dispose of. As we look ahead to the 2015 vision, Hanford will once again help set the stage for the future of both energy and technology in the United States, and perhaps the world. While completing the 2015 vision 
and shrinking the majority of the Hanford cleanup to the central plateau represents a very significant accomplishment. Still, much work remains. The 75-square-mile central plateau contains hundreds of large, complex hazardous waste sites, hundreds of contaminated facilities, including the five huge processing canyons, contamination deep in the ground that has the potential to affect groundwater, and the operation of the waste treatment plant and treatment of the 53 million gallons of waste contained in the 177 underground tanks. This difficult and complex work will take years to complete. However, the Department of Energy is evaluating innovative new technologies to accelerate completion of the tank waste mission. As this progress is made, the Department of Energy has planned for the potential uses of SiteLand in the future, including designated areas for preservation and potential industrial development, as well as conservation and recreation. Because cleanup will never result in the complete elimination of all contamination, the government will continue to play an active role in Hanford's long-term stewardship to help protect its magnificent cultural, natural, and historic heritage. <laughs>